Uh, we're going we're gonna to get started. Uh, welcome uh, and thanks for being here on quite a weird weather, weather day. If this was slightly earlier in the morning, I don't think many of us would have been inclined to, to make the trip. Um, thanks especially to Pawan and Natalia for the help in making uh, this event possible. Uh, my name is Arnav Adhikari. I'm a fifth year grad student in English and I'm incredibly excited to welcome Professor Toral Gajawala to Brown. Um, I've been really eager to make this event happen for quite a long time now, so it's great to finally have Professor Gajawala here as part of the grad student seminar series at the Saxena Center. Um, we hope to have plenty of time for discussion after the, after the talk, uh, so I encourage all of you, regardless of your specialization and field, to please share openly your responses, ideas, and questions as they emerge. This is an open forum for conversation, um, one that actually began earlier this week when we convened a small reading group um, to discuss Professor Gajawala's uh, book, Untouchable Fictions, Literary Realism, and the Crisis of Caste, which was published on Fordham University Press in 2013. Um, so while today's talk and Professor Gajawala's current work has perhaps moved away from the primary concerns of that first book, I do want to highlight its importance for the study of not just South Asian literature, but for thinking about the project of modern and modernist literary genre as such. Um, and further, what such projects hold as their political um, imperatives and aesthetic attachments. Uh, the book argues that multilingual Dalit literature must therefore be read as a heterogeneous body of work that moves across the political and the aesthetic, the everyday, the otherworldly, the revisionist and revolutionary. Professor Gajrawala's own movement across discourses and linguistic traditions, whether it's Indian literary history, um, European realism, the postcolonial novel, world, world literature, um, all with an unwavering focus on how so-called vernacular or regional literatures um, might be read as constitutive to these kind of transnational aesthetic projects has been a quite uh, a vital intervention. Uh, one that I think is valuable for many of us working in literary studies or adjacent fields. Um, it's a practice that she calls following D.R. Nagaraj a quote, commitment to not read exclusively. Um, as she writes uh, in Untouchable Fictions, quote, the question for us then is not only what happens when narrative forms travel, but of what happens when there is a dissonance between the purported ideologies encoded by genre, form, and language, and those envisioned by political movement. So it's not surprising then that Professor Gajawala's work since reveals a similarly expansive commitment. Uh, an associate professor of English at NYU, she's written about the YouTube channel Dalit Camera, the graphic novel Munnu, A Boy from Kashmir, um, and edited the recently published Bloomsbury Handbook of Postcolonial Print Cultures. Her current book project, Ajnabi, an, ex an Existential Reckoning in South Asia, considers the afterlife of postcolonial existentialisms in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the works of artists, playwrights, poets, uh, in conceptualizing an alternative discourse of freedom. So please join me in welcoming Professor Thora Gachawala to Brown. Yeah, I think that would be good. Hello, can you hear me? Is it fine? Yeah, so. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. That was very nice. And thank you to Arnav and also to Pavan and Natalia for um, arranging this visit, which we've been discussing since last year, in fact, but finally came to fruition today. So I was going to be like a little bit adventurous today. I was going to make a joke, but now that it's being recorded, I won't make that joke. Um, you know, but I, I thought I would actually share with you a work in progress. Um, so I'll be eager to hear what you think about it. On the way to this uh, second book on modernism in South Asia, I came across the work of a painter that I had been interested in on which I couldn't really find very much material and so this is a little bit of a kind of sideshow on that project that I fell really into in a deep way so here it is and I titled the presentation Lost in the World How Innocent You Are after a poetic verse that the painter K. H. Ara was known to to sing so I'm going to read but you are also very welcome to interrupt me along the way um, in 1963, the painter K. H. Ara of the Progressive Artist Group in Bombay did a series of startling nudes for a solo exhibition at the Pundole Art Gallery. Having worked primarily on still lifes, gargantuan flowers and vases, Ara's nudes, including those presented at the Taj Gallery in 1962, were new. 
Prior to Ada, there were few nudes to be seen, and it was only his practice that made of them an Indian genre. Yes. Is it? It's on. It's on, right? Is that? Okay. Just let me know if you can't hear me. Okay. Um, Ada's nudes offer a critical conundrum in art history in that they present as both a rude, also rough interruption into the modernist arena, a sharp detour from practice. And yet these nudes, long before the kiss in cinema or sex in the novel, injected something new into the space of modernist practice, not only in terms of the democratization of the body politic, but in terms of color. Many of these nudes were black. Ara too injects something new into the space of modernist studies. Ara was Dalit. If for Gayatri Spivak, the representation of the woman is the radical counterfactual in history, then what to make of Ara's still lives, not his still lives of black vases and nondescript flowers, but his still female bodies, not in motion, rather at rest. So in this talk, I address Ara's body and bodies as an attempt to reinsert the caste question into the space of progressive and modernism, avant la lettre. Jacques Rancière discusses anachronism not as blending epochs or mixed chronologies, but impropriety. Impropriety for Rancière is the cardinal sin of the historian, whose chronic logic insists that things stay in their time, place. Of course, literature, Rancière mentions fiction and art rarely do. Certainly, impropriety, in both Rancière's sense and the more mundane one, offer a modality for Ara's nudes, which appear on the modernist scene with little local geographical precedent, but only a European, though not necessarily colonial one. The normative conditions of postcolonial modernity would make such discronies de rigueur. Modernism in the postcolonial context of this kind made of this kind of artistic gesture, routine, mundane, just another instance of the collagist, as Robert Young writes of Aimé Césaire, or the refracted, as Achille Mbembe writes of African culture in the postcolony, or interreferential, as Gita Kapoor writes of Indian modernism more generally. Ara was notably taken by European Impressionism and the internationalism of the then Indian art context, and his brief travels to France and Bulgaria would have exposed him to certain bodies. And yet the mandate for new national forms in the post-colonial period, to paint with absolute freedom for content and technique, almost anarchic, goes the manifesto of the progressive arts movement, as well as the fixation on nude female bodies suggest dyschronic impropriety in terms of genre, the classicist or derivative nude, and affect, the potentially salacious and shameless nude. As Uday Kumar says of the Dalit avant la lettre writer C. Ayappan, he did not inhabit the space of literary modernism very well. So too for Ara, whose Gauguin-esque ladies, occasionally perched a la poil next to vases and occasional tables, were drawn not in the jagged angles of Picasso or his peers, but in robust fleshy hues and contoured in the flesh. By all accounts, Ara, the son of a bus driver who lost his mother early, left home at a young age, perhaps seven or eight, and he raised himself on the streets of Bombay. He never attended much school or university, and his education was that of street life. He washed cars, cleaned homes. On the side, out of view, he painted. When he was working for a Japanese auto firm as a car washer, the, crudol the critic Rudolf von Leiden spied his florals and encouraged him. An earlier European employer whose home he kept provided him with paint. Before Ara, Ara became Ara, he worked from the servants' quarters of his Japanese boss in watercolors. After, he remained there in a small 10 by 10 room for the rest of his life. With the exception of a few grand scenes, a few portraits, and a nuclear Christ, Ara painted still lifes and nudes. Some of his work in pencil and watercolor is eminently touchable and alive. Other works are hyperbolic, surreal, but breathing, bodily in terms of color and shade. In both cases, all these bodies, flat and curvaceous and tan, brown, black, sat uneasily with the viewer. They were not sexual, as many noted, as they did with Indian modernism as it was being constructed. How anachronistic and old-fashioned the nude, traditional, formalist, academic, and yet how avant la lettre. Like Sadekin's similarly asexual nudes, if Ara's bodies were criticized as ungainly, disproportionate, asexual, anti-erotic, these features were themselves kind of noteworthy in the elaboration of a new kind of subject. 
Ara himself is a similarly kind of dyschronic figure. When he began painting, the category of the Dalit artist or writer was not yet available, despite B.R. Ambedkar's rhetorical, if only occasional, use of the term since the 1930s. The dominant forms of resistance to the status quo took the shape and frame of those offered by the left, the party, the worker, and the people. Oops. Figures like Annabal Sate, the mill worker and communist singer and playwright, did gravitate towards Ambedkar, eventually recasting his political identity as a Dalit one. But Ara, whose political life was initiated via Gandhianism, he was jailed during the Salt March, is typically understood in the idiom that was available in his context, shorn as he was of family and region, that of the rebel artist, the modernist individual. Can the question of caste offer an analytic to make sense of these dyschronic improprieties? I want to thus read anachronism and dyschrony as the thing that is there before it is present, that takes a form not taken, a color not yet illuminated, even when it is so named. Ada's bodies, brushing the borders of caste propriety, touchable and touching things, might now acquire a new visibility or legibility as Dalit form. Few critical appraisals of Ara's work exists, and there appears to be no systematic study of his oeuvre, nor a catalogue raisonné. His period of flowering was also accompanied by harsh critique. The poet Nassim Ezekiel, upon seeing Ara's work in a show, was utterly disappointed. Much as I enjoy them, they suggest to me a lush boudoir atmosphere with expensive curtains and carpets, period furniture, and a Junoesque form, a bourgeois erotic setting. Yashodara Dalmia describes his nudes as still, like still life objects, and Rudolf von Leiden says they are sufficient into themselves, content to exist without us. The few critiques of his body of work that do focus on these large that exist focus largely on these generic conventions and little on color other than its explicit and deliberate brightness. Ezekiel notes its garishness, which is almost like saying nothing at all. However, Dalmia mentions, interestingly, his use of white. The color, which in and of itself is artificial as it is not found in nature, was used by him to mold form. For Dalmia, this white, entirely original, also reflects silhouettes, deepens, and aligns, potentially creating an infinite recess. In her analysis, women are a device for Ara, one that allows for chromatic exploration. Can chromatic exploration, investigation of color, and women as device be simply a painterly problem in a newly decolonized India imagined by a Dalit Muslim modernist? To take one example of Ara's nudes, untitled like most, lying flat such that we have an aerial view, what kind of nude is this? The care reflected in the body, torso, thighs, breast, lapses into <clears throat> a carelessness in hands and face. Firstly, this strange composition is cut off at hands and feet with a singular focus on the torso. Not a nude in the traditional sense of a full-bodied portrait, this nude is indifferent to its viewer and bears an expression of slight unease in a private universe. The signature red in the cloth under the body or the shadow of paint helps to throw this black nude in relief. The red might be the red of the Baroque or blood or Hinduism. In another piece, untitled and undated, I think I've switched the slides. The seated nude can be, oh, you know what, I'm gonna go to this one. Oh, maybe I actually excised it. Okay, so let's stay with this one. I'll just mention another nude that I didn't include here in which the portrait is of a woman kind of over her forehead. You can only see her in profile and her long hair is falling. So her face is also obscured, similar to the previous one that I was showing. <clears throat> And that nude, neither bathing nor washing, neither dressing nor modeling, is a non-realist disjunctive nude with only a table and flowers as context. By these examples, Ara's nude is neither a nude in the sense of derivative 19th century European salon practices, and nor are they black in the sense of being dominated by black paint or African subject matter. The black nude is rather washed in tints of black and unbeautified for a painterly gaze. To whom did these bodies belong and what kind of relation was sketched between painter and painted? Ara's figures, eyes closed, hidden, eclipsed, are sometimes caught unaware. 
The woman lying on the red cloth does not know that she has seen from above. Her and their indifference to both the painter's gaze and our own may be a feature of the nude as genre, and yet to be indifferent, even unconscious, of a potentially stultifying and potentially othering gaze, a suffocating reification in Fanonian terms, suggests a different kind of subject. The critical tendency has been to see bodies in the realm of the sensuous, but these nudes arrive on a different terrain. The black nudes, robust and indifferent, unabstracted, unglorified, not motionless, but bodies at rest. In a context in which nudity is reprehensible and in the sense of a caste-deep society has connotations of shame and humiliation, these nudes bear, bear none of this affect, when in social fact, there's so much shame to potentially bear. In fact, to strip one nude is the most shameful act of gender and caste violation. Natasha Dinker points out that as opposed to the European tradition of nuda veritas, the intertwining of nudity and truth, the Indian context has historically favored adornment, precisely so as not to make available a narrative of rape. Ara's nudes are in fact adorned if unclothed. They occasionally bear nose rings and flowers in their hair. This decontextualization of the nude, outside history, society, sociality, the real ensures the women's freedom and the indifferent or coy gaze which we sometimes see. Ara's nudes are thus distinct from a colonialist tradition of anthropological looking, from a European tradition of nude painting, from an Orientalist register of seeing colored bodies, and from the painter Amrita Shergill's early 20th century self-visualizing. They depart in significant ways from the nude as genre. And yet, insisting on the nude as naked, simply naked, a chronist preoccupation most certainly, these bodies also avoid the affective tenor of shame, humiliation, exposure, and exploitation that can accompany the brown or black body on display. These nudes are rather nude in the sense of a formal stylization, an interest in certain conventions, and the use of color to explore modern bodies. As naked, as unclothed, and yet brushing up against tables, bowls of fruit, vases, and flowers, <clears throat> scenes glimpsed through shutters, they reflect an interest in the larger socialization of women's bodies, disrobed outside of coercion, with pleasure and yet not salacious, outside of boudoir spaces and coy looks, and outside of the metaphorical harem. In some of these nudes, the women appear to be sleeping. The nudes may be looked at, but continue on in a world of their own preoccupation. In several, heads are bisected from the page so that only the face below the eyes are visible and the naked body frontally occupies the canvas. In many, they are deliberately unreal and incongruous as if posed, seated on a chair, perched near a wooden table, and deliberately unreal. <clears throat> As many critics have noted, their faces are turned away, concealed, backs bared, and sometimes as if the artist had only incidentally come upon them. Nude, new, naked are actually all derivations of the Latin nudus, which itself is a derivation of the Sanskrit nagra and nagna, root nag, to have shame. In some criticism, this is read as a result of Ara's Muslim prudery, for example, Yashodara Damia, while in others, the choice of nudes is read as an attempt to conquer just that. Irrespective, the movement between nude and naked, nude as naked, cannot be neutral in the context where nudity is primarily an act of humiliation. Reading nude as genre or form excises it from the social, insisting that women are neutrally naked reinserts this element. Ara's nudes were noted by several critics as improper in their anatomical deviancy. What if in the naked body adjacent to the side of a table and flowers, reflected in the inverse in a mirror or painting on the wall, what if this was not simply the woman's body, but Ara's own? I think of the Urdu verse that Ara was known to sing, lost in the world, lost in thought. Might these nudes be a kind of strange extroversion, a form of first-person narration? Like the Kannada playwright Girish Karnad, who says of the modernist moment, at the most intense moment of self-expression, there had been no dramatic structure in my own tradition to which I could relate myself. Ara's expressive practices, his dramatic structure, took the form of the nude. He never married, he was never associated with any man or woman. Later in his life, he befriended a family and adopted their daughter. He was sometimes referred to as her grandmother or his god her godmother. Outside of art institutions and formal education, outside of patrimony and genealogy, Ara was queer. Always in three-piece suits, he cut, painted an unusual figure, like his ladies. 
Firstly, it must be said that both the title of the show, The Black Nudes, and the paintings underline black and nude as a trope in a deliberate way. Both a play on words as well as an oxymoron, the title gestures to opacity and transparency, colors and identities. If the ideology of the nude as a genre is clarity, transparency, and the body denuded, then black's impenetrability poses a kind of problem. As is well nude, as is well known, the few black subjects that might have been seen in the history of European art are black figures in nudes, i.e. black women clothed as slaves or servants to white female nudes. Let's get this one. The central text in this complex genealogy would be the modernist self-portraits of Amrita Shergil, particularly her self-portrait as a Tahitian, which Saloni Mathur cites as an exemplary negotiation by a female protagonist of a masculine paradigm of the modern artist and a theatrical intervention in the question of the female nude. The insertion of the female self here into the Manichaean gendered space of the nude genre and the space of the French colonial landscape presents an interesting model for the Indian nude, simultaneously evocative of Paul, Paul Gauguin's Tahitian and its Orientalist gaze, and also in contradistinction. Another key intertext might be F. N. Souza's Black Art and Other Paintings, the exhibition soon to follow in 1966, <coughs> uh, which was shown in England. A product of decolonization, immigration, and racial politics there, Souza's monochromes were painted in London between 1964 and 1965. As Atri Gupta says of the latter, by this time, black was part of a new dialectic of black consciousness. In the Francophone context, with the coming of Negritude and the work of Aimé Césaire and Léopold Senghor, Jean-Paul Sartre would be prompted to write, Being is Black. By the mid-century, in other words, decolonization of the third world, a tradition of nude paintings intersecting with the colonial gaze, and America as a site of a racial reckoning, all would inform any politics of color. Given that Ara was considered essentially a colorist, what did black mean? In Ara's art, we might say, black becomes a color in and for itself rather than one element of an artistic technology. And it is distinct from the brown of realist figuration, a brown that is entirely distinct from black. Still, black here metaphorizes many things. It should be reiterated that neither black nor nude can be considered neutral or even subjective categories. If Euro-America had considered color to be driven by emotion, one famous art critic refers, you know, says that nothing is more subjective than the reaction to color. Then color in the colony was an objective raison d'etre for the native. Thomas Macaulay's famous statement proposed to transform the native via intellect, though he would remain India, Indian in caste and color. The trope of the brown side, the subcontinental Englishman, who is the same but not quite, recolored the value of this class category in the colonial context. The context of the 1960s, in addition to the intellectual critical dominant in the post-colony, meant that there was no space outside the political. And even for the apolitical painter, color would necessarily be seen in a new light. It is in this way, too, that Ada's still lives appear as dyschronic, still but naked, colored but black. In subcontinental language, however, black far preceded and exceeded decolonization in Africa, which could only have been two among many different reference. Black is both the color and sometimes the name of Shiva, whose blue-throatedness is often figured as black. Vishnu, who in the form of Srinathji is exclusively pre presented in black marble or black paint, and Krishna phenotypically blue, etymologically blue-black, is in fact the first name of Ara himself. By the time of Ara's black nudes and Souza's black paintings, black would be circulating as a sign of evil, of the mysticism of night, as a caste of slur, the metaphor for the terrible age, the darkness of the goddess's wrath, as well as coterminously and cotemporally with the beloved black and blue bodies of night of Shiva and Krishna. Its transcendentalist modernist tone, as in S.H. Raza's Bindu series, was yet to appear. This Hindu Indic register was overlain with a modernist metaphysics in which black might connote variably infinity, the divine, darkness, immortality, and the degradation of the soul. The philosopher Lewis Gordon writes that the blues are black. Blue is the color of black philosophy given the historical interrelation between blues music as a black genre and the psychic blues of the black experience in America. 
In the Indian context, certainly by the mid 20th century, the swirl of the nationalist movement would have brought certain color truisms to light. The value of Gandhi and white, always white, color of simplicity and Khadi, in contradistinction to the normative flush of colored cloth hastened by the colonial textile trade in the form of China sinks. China silk and madras, the earthy browns of dirt, soil, land, folk, as well as the German fascists and saffron torchbearers. The Orientalist tradition read the natives as full of color. Their dress, their clothes, and indeed modernist art of the subcontinent was, like modernist art more broadly, a wash in color. Michael Taussig reminds us of Proust's fetishistic view of the Algerian Zouaves and the Indians with their turbans. Quote, the Africans in their red divided skirts, the Indians in their white turbans, were enough to transform for me this Paris through which I was walking into a whole imaginary exotic city and oriental scene. In Taussig's world, <clears throat> color registers the spiritual, the mystical, and the occult. Color is not symbolic per se, but self-referential and evocative. He quotes Wittgenstein, color spurs us to philosophize. What role did a mandate to color, color both things and color bodies, play in critique? The art critic Charles Fabry refers to the palette of modern painter Ram Kumar and key figure of the Naikahani writers as dull and dusty, a reflection perhaps of a certain chromophilic vision in modern India. In Natasha Eaton's analysis, color is put to a different and strategic use by modern politics and nationalist regimes. The political work of color sense and color creation takes on different power in the colony. Walter Langhammer, the Austrian painter so influential to the progressive art group of Bombay, who escaped to India with his Jewish wife prior to World War II, famously said, I'm in it for the color. Ara's compatriot and fellow member of the Bombay Progressives, S.H. Raza's color studies, did much to advance a thinking about color beyond Orientalist cliché offering it degree, gradation, and geometric form, with which he experimented later in life. His Bindu series of black dots would take up the entirety of his practice in the 1980s. I'm thus inclined towards the Sartrean reading, where black is color, better still, light, its soft radiance which dissolves our habits. The dissolution of norms associated with color strikes me as the register within which these artists were working. But in Ara's work, precisely because of his insistence on the form of the nude, color is not just a theoretical, aesthetic, or chromophilic question, but brings bodies and humans to bear. Color cannot help but be affixed to questions of race and caste. Ara's interest in certain classical forms, on the threshold of modernity, as one critic says, is typically understood pictorially, imagistically, but we might extend this knowledge to a discussion of difference made legible through color. So I want to pay particular attention to one element of Ara's paintings, a feature referred to in other artistic contexts as mise en abime, the image of the image embedded within. In Ara's Black Woman, that's actually the title of this painting, a black nude, hair and skin contiguous in color and form, sits in the foreground with her back to us, opposite a round wooden coffee table, on top of which sits an enormous bouquet of flowers in vase. Juxtaposing Ara's two primary interests, bodies and flowers, the painting is a wash of rust red, walls, table, floor, against which the black nude is thrown into a kind of deliberate relief. However, in the top left corner is a black nude. A portrait and profile on a white background so dark as to appear like a silhouette is hanging on the wall. The drama of the painting, which is actually a watercolor, so he's known to have used watercolors layering on top of each other to create a paint-like um, effect, is actually in this silhouette, which is hanging on the wall. <clears throat> Unlike the earlier still lives in which there is little drama, the inverted relationship here between the nude, her painting, and the portrait, which she both owns and is. In one painting, then, there are two concise and deliberate black bodies. Both the nude as a genre and form and the semi-realist representation of the drawing room nude, like Flaubert's barometer, are collapsed in one frame. So Ara's black nude appears not once but twice, as foreground and background, as subject and decor, as narrative, meta-narrative, and substance and critique. The very same technique appears in multiple Ara works, including another untitled, undated watercolor. The mise en abime that features often in his work raises several interesting questions. Is this black nude the object of the gaze or the consumer of art? Is the black nude looking at herself or another? Is the black nude then a self-portrait, a self-nude? 
But Ara's mizanabim is too indistinct and opaque to take the question further. Given that the nude's nude warrants less spatial attention than her flowers, the painting might be better considered as a recognition of the body as artwork and the recognition of scenes of looking. I want to suggest that the formal element of the mise en abime underlines the superimposition of the dark nude onto the scene of the drawing room, in and of itself a kind of provocative act. When has the drawing room been a site for blackness? And how did Ara, the interloper, see the household of the European woman for whom he worked? It is in the superimposition of the nude and her image that we see a kind of answer. In the drawing room scenes of academic realism that Ara would have encountered, perhaps in books, perhaps during his trips to France and Bulgaria, the only black body was that of the slave or the servant. Ara's penchant, the black nude arrives while looking at herself. In modernist studies inflected by photography and cinema, mise en abime is a kind of citation, a text within a text, a reproduction of another logic, even a proto-digital repetition. The affective tenor of that citation might, in the form, might be in the form of a negligible there but there not reality effect or an act of homage. Citation can, for example, seek to embed a text within a certain literary history or trace a semantic or visual genealogy between various formal elements. A structural similarity between frame and inset allows for correlation, even a mirror text. However, mise en abime as a theoretical term is typically attributed to André Gide, who notes that the reflective element of the mirror within a work of art on whose surface the scene might appear. From Gide, the conceptual richness as a form emerges, imaged as the night's heraldry, without end, a sense of transcendental meaning. What Dorit Cohn refers to as medical, metaphysical mystery, or Borges refers to as the endless series and the infinite regress. This sense of metaphysical repetition is implicit in Ara's oeuvre, which consists almost entirely of nudes and flowers, for which variation was primarily in terms of color, but also in the hermeneutics of Ara's work, which is typically understood as simple, simplistic, untutored, but quite unique in the use of this formal structure. Firstly, Ara was interested in paintings of paintings. In an undated watercolor characterized as a still life is a small table on which sits a bowl of fruit, perhaps mangoes, grapes. On the table itself sits a pineapple and a black vase of flowers. However, in the background are a collection of watercolors sketched, literally, as in only very faintly sketched, a black smudge of a buffalo against the outline of brown hills, and in another, a woman carries reeds or perhaps refuse. One canvas, obscured by a drooping flower from the vase in front of it, appears blank. Finally, in the last watercolor is a woman in black, a darkened silhouette holding the hand of a child, a black nude once again. In another painting from the period is staged a magnificent scene of reading, the black nude at the table, lounging, arms folded, and head bent over a book. The mirror text, a nude, watches from the wall. In some ways, however, the focus on the mise-en-scene and the scene of reading is a bit of misdirection. If race operates in the visual register, caste is understood through the phenomenology of touch, and I'm thinking here of Anike Jaure's book, Practicing Caste. How, for example, does the leather ball on which cricket relies become eminently touchable, even lickable, think of Malinga, while wholly excising its leather, its leather work, and its leather worker? This is Gopal Guru's question in the aesthetics of touch and skin, and the answer for him does not lie in a Marxist reification. In that sense, the castized reading of the Ara painting makes legible the radical act of reading, of touching the book, Ambedkar's book, eyes downcast for a different reason, not that reason, and the open, indiscreet, almost improper splaying of the body, touching books, tables, chairs, the domestic, in a state of vigilant ease. Impropriety again. Are nudes black? In fact, no, in the, Indi in the Indian context, no. Amrita Shergill's autoportraits aside, it was Ara who made nudes black. I want to suggest here a reconfiguration of both black and nude, engendered by a formal preoccupation with seeing, but also touching. Seeing through porticos, framing and reframing, paintings of paintings and mise en abime, touching house, home, the household, and the domestic. Secondly, Ara's nudes mark a very particular and dramatic scene of arrival. Given the juxtaposition of both the boudoir erotic and or Western living with the dark body of the nude as the new post-colonial subject, these compositions stage a scene never before seen. Rather than a collage of haphazard things, the black nudes sit at the table artistically and art historically. 
To ask our nudes black is thus to ask a series of un uncomfortable questions in intellectual history. How might caste and the modern sit at the same table? And how do genres, modes, styles, and aesthetic forms travel, or do they at all? In fact, these deliberately black nudes underline that Indian postcolonial identity has a relationship to color, that bodies are black and red and yellow, and that caste plays a role. As noted, this is a period in which figures like Louis Dumont will insist on the uniqueness of the Indian caste system and its distinction from race. Prior to the mode of strong indigenization of caste, in fact, there were many efforts to globalize the question, particularly in the context of US racism. The most famous case of this would be, of course, the Dalit Panthers. Soon after, in the early 1970s, Dalits created the organization Vision, Volunteers in Service to India's Oppressed and Neglected, which had the explicit goal of organizing alongside black Americans. Their slogan was Dalit Rights for Human Rights. The history of reading race in the lexicon of caste, as in the caste school <clears throat> of American sociology, is also well known, and the scholarship of Oliver Cox, Gunnar Myrdal, and the caste school of race was key to considering mutual forms of subjection. As the world of art in the subcontinent moved towards jagged forms of representation, cubist bodies rearranged and abstract metaphysical landscapes, Ada offers bodies in the flesh. As the arts of Bombay disassembled and dissected bodies, like you can imagine Thayad Mehta's um, slashed bodies, Ara's whole body spread wide on canvases. Can we read the question of caste via this productive asynchrony? Ara was by all accounts of Muslim origin and of the depressed castes. Given the phenotypic indeterminacy of caste, black might be interpreted in a realist register as brown, i.e. the bodies of fellow women, but also in a metaphysical register as dark, where dark and black can connote a caste on the subcontinent. Unlike F.N. Souza, whose black paintings of the 1960s were formed in the context of European artistic training in post-war Britain, Ara's black nudes were made at home. Rudolf von Leiden would say, the drama of existence, the very fact of being, can evolve from the humblest things in an Ara painting. In other words, can we read in the forms of Ara's incongruity, the lush boudoir plus the ungainly nude, the still life objects plus the black bodies, a form of caste insertion, the black, brown, out of sorts, ungainly figure at the draped window, across the velvety bed, seated at the rosewood table. While there was seemingly no critical language for the seating arrangement at the time, Aras was, in its classicism, an entirely original project. Finally, Aras' détournement, the refusal or turning away implicit in his nudes, suggests something very interesting about the female body, typically divided equally between visual consumption and sex, beauty and lust. These women, a world of women, there are few men in Aras' oeuvre, are neither. It's in this sense that we might think of Ara as inserting himself into a tradition, a beneficiary of European nudes, as well as tradition-free. Not only untutored in art, Ara was uneducated as an individual. Having left home at a young age, he was detached from his family and in a structural way isolated from his past. In fact, the critical blank around Ara's identity, noted as both Dalit and Muslim, and the mystery of genealogy, given his departure at a young age and subsequent rupture with his family and origins, all serve as an interesting problem for the historian concerned with propriety. What was bequeathed to Ara? Peers comment on his love for Urdu poetry and his distinctive fashionable style. But Ara is an example of a kind of anti-genealogy creating a new from the world around him in a mode quite different from others in the progressive artist group and of course from others in the world of arts. These nudes are thus Indian and black in a post-colonial context in which colorism associ associated with caste could be socially debilitating. Ara's black nudes by color alone could have coded as low caste. This makes his incongruous nudes even more remarkable, especially if we consider his work as putting the Dalit woman in the drawing room and at the dining table. Ada's black, figuratively speaking, is not black in the abstract, it is for people. And those people, it must be underlined, are not black in an amerocentric understanding of the term, but are Indian. By this I mean that Ada's nudes are phenotypically and culturally coded as his compatriots, wearing bindis, saris, sometimes tropicalized banana, palm trees, parted hair. It is this element that sometimes generates their incongruity, even anachronism, next to upright vases, tall stems, drapes, and coffee tables. 
In a sea of jagged figures in which D and reformation of the physical form is the norm, Ara's shapes and lines are recognizable. His sketches put flesh on bodies, his layering of colors color that flesh. Focused with a singular intensity on still lifes and nudes, on fruits, flowers, and bodies, Ara's paintings bear none of the traces of interruption, dismemberment, and dissection of those bodies floating around him. But in the realm of the chromatic, Ara might well be seen as avant la lettre. How symptomatic of the multiscalar modernism, the mixed development of the modern in post-colonial India. Okay, so by way of conclusion, I leave you with a watercolor done by Ara, thought to be that of a European woman in oriental dress. As Uday Kumar says of the writer C. Ayapan, the luminosity of a different literary climate has begun to fall on his pages, giving them a strangely unseasonable legibility. The strange light of a modern caste race color language is one way to re-perceive Ara, as is the broad humanist ethic he shared with many fellow artists of the first generation. Ara's nudes, roughly the same period as Siyapan, also emerged in a context and location politicized by caste. It was the period of B.R. Ambedkar's formal con conversion in Nagpur, along with some 500,000 others in the fall of 1956, and his subsequent large Buddhist funeral procession in the streets of Bombay just a few months later. It was the period of Dalit Bombay, and within a few years, the manifesto of the Dalit Panthers inspired by the Black Panthers and the specter of black power. Ara is not perceived as a Dalit painter. His divorce from his origins and the little knowledge available regarding his background impede any such association between work and life, just as they prevent the overdetermination of such a reading. Still, Ara's work has always been seen in a strange light, outside of the glare of fame showered on his peers like Ahmed Hussein, outside of the flagrant activism of F.N. Souza, or the metaphysical abstractions of Raza and Padamsi. His limited time abroad, distinct from these others, also made of him a kind of local artist and ally to others, particularly through his work at the Artist Center. He was the patron saint of all sufferers, his daughter is quoted as saying. Ara's black nudes came to their end in the mid-1960s, but they met, might be read anachronically in light of a comment he made in his later years. During the Gujarat riots of 1985, post the Mandal Commission decision that was to allocate additional protected seats, reservations, for scheduled castes, Ara said to his adopted daughter, so much blood has been shed, how can I use color? The riots of 1985 began with anti-reservationist protests, spiraled into communal attacks, citywide strikes, the burning of buses and police cars, looting and outright murder. Marked by the first moment of calm politics, political alliance between Kshatriyas, Harijans, Adivasis, and Muslims, this form of political and electoral sociability jostled the dominance of the upper castes and classes. The city burned for six months. In this Ara's poetry after Auschwitz moment, the use of color, still possible after the brutal partition of India, was corrupted by the blood flowing in Gujarat. For Ara, 1985 generated only paintings of slashed canvases, burnt holes, from which white paper or cloth peaked, but without any color. Ara's Dalit Muslim identity may have played a particular role in this tragic response. Irrespective, color, including its absence, is newly imbued with meaning and reflective of the circumstances of life, aesthetical political choice, and Ara's bent, as he moves from color to texture, we might say, to touch even. Like Adorno's poetry, color emerges as the metric of an ethical framework. Hardly idle, Ara's black nudes are then necessarily inflected by a sense of determined interventionism, whereby reading backwards from Ara's color after Gujarat moment, color equals consequence. When Michael Tausig asks what color is the sacred, he's seeking an answer to a question of how color moves from chemical to paint to carbon to consciousness. Ara's black, in my anachronistic reading, color long associated with spiritual transcendentalist reading of religion and art is now politicized as a form of worldly intervention. Thank you. Could you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah I think okay. uh, we had some I was wondering. Well, but I think everybody was able to hear. Okay. But yeah, and thank you, Thoral, so much. That was uh, so rich, and there was so much going on that I know that we want to just sit with a little bit more. We have plenty of time for discussion. Um, I would encourage everybody to 
to um, participate. Uh, I think maybe just by way of opening, um, I'll, ju I'll just say first of all, I'm I'm very curious about what your joke was um, <laughs> that you're that you're withholding. But but I'm happy to to discuss that later. But um, I, I I found this this framing of um, via Ranciere or like a response of of a kind of dyschronic impropriety to be mm. really interesting and and I think just as a framework to think what does it mean to think about. Um, not inhabiting a space well um, is, I think, just um, can offer offer a lot. N not necessarily inhabiting a space properly, but just to not inhabit it quite um, as expected or, or, or quite right. I was also thinking, as you were talking about this kind of fascinating uh, line of the mise en abeam, um, to a kind of over text of modernist painting as well, which is Greenberg's um, idea of the kind of mm the the modernist canvas constantly sort of referencing itself in a way and so it's responding even to that to another body of art historical um kind of uh, criticism as well in a sense um and so i i guess just just to open up a conversation a little bit and to think about um you, you know your your project that you're working on right now around kind of these uh, you know south asian existentialism or, or its afterlives rather um could you maybe speak a little bit more about how these forms travel as you say um across your, the rest of the project because um you know of course you you work across many kinds of media but um, i'm just interested in how you make the move from a kind of literary analysis to the work of the visual mm -hmm. that's also encoding a kind of different intellectual history. And so I'm just interested where it sort of fits in into the broader um, framework just to sort of start off. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm kind of interested in like what Edward Said refers to as traveling theory and, you know, just how concepts move around and what happens when they do. And, you know, when they move, do they become something else? And, you know, where do they fall and die, et cetera? And I, I'm partly interested in this because of, you know, the recent focus and desire to produce non-Western epistemologies. In other words, to, pro, you know, present ways of thinking and knowing that aren't organized by, you know, Western civilization, but that actually emerge from the ground up. And also a critique of that, a kind of, you know, nativist critique of exactly that, you know, that we can only use this kind of critique to understand this kind of framework. And so, I mean, the first thing to say is like this period, the 1950s and 1960s, is actually um, just such a mobile, moving period. So it's actually not very surprising that even someone like Ara, who basically spent his whole life in this really small room, 10 by 10 room, there's a famous story about him that he wanted to work on this grand canvas. So he would paint it, and then he would let it dry, and he would roll it up, and then he would move to the next section, because his room just did not allow enough space to unroll the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So even someone impoverished um, in this situation you know, was able to put together some money to to spend a few days in Bulgaria, to spend a few days in France. I think he also was in Switzerland as well, but I haven't found any um, like kind of evidence of this really. Um, but it, it also suggests like the moving nature of the artists and also the kind of intellectual things they were engaged with. Um, so I was mentioning to you earlier, actually I, I didn't mention this to you, but completely randomly, I bumped into someone studying art history on the train sitting right next to me who was really interested in my slides <laughs> and had a whole conversation with her. Um, but, you know, I was just telling her how, like, the Japanese sculptor Isamu Noguchi ended up in India during this period, and this is the period in which he kind of was creating akaris, which are those uh, Japanese lamps made out of washi paper that you can kind of see through that are really delicate. So, you know, there's a whole um, very interesting interesting circuit of writers, artists, thinkers that are moving to different places. And I think clearly all of this work is very much affected by that. But I think that necessarily engenders that epistemologies um, and theories are also going to move. Mm. So I guess I was taken in part by the fact that, you know, Ara seems so weird. And he seems so weird because he's doing this really retro thing. So everybody else is trying to paint for like a newly decolonized India and trying to think of progressive ways to use structure, shape, light, color. And Ara decides to go back to nudes. And not only does he go back to nudes, he goes back t to nudes in like a non disjunctive way, in a non-cubist way, in a non-geometric way, um, but in, in some ways in a kind of very tra 
traditional way. So I think that in and of itself is sort of interesting that he found the nude to be an interesting problem or a way to work uh, towards things. But then, you know, in the moment of the 60s, he also does a whole series of paintings around, let's say, dark, if not just black, black and dark, um, that, you know, opens up a whole nother set of questions um, around color. Um, so yeah, I don't think I've yeah. answered your question. No, but, that's, that's really yeah. interesting because I think like you're trying to sort of return to a kind of conversation or a discourse of cosmopol post-war mm. cosmopolitanism, mm. but not quite in the vein that, that let's say it's, it's commonly spoken of in mm. terms of a kind of, um, I don't know, there seems to be something anachronistic as you say about mm. it. And, um, it's interesting what you're saying about this return in this sort of moment looking to a kind of decolonized future, but a return to a kind of past mm. um, of a tradition, um, some, you know, conversation that we were having in the reading group around, around your first book was to think about what kind of liberatory potential is there in, in abstraction, in the kind of this binary of abstraction or a kind of materialist practice and whether, mm. um, you know, it, it's, just, it's just interesting to think about because often I think we talked about how we sort of invest um, uh, the kind of forms of protest or politics in a kind of um, concrete material sense, mm -hmm. um, but in what ways can abstraction also sort of provide mm -hmm. provide that? And I think it's it's particularly interesting in in that book, but I, I'm seeing shadows of it here as well in in what you're saying um, because it's this this is returning to a kind of whole form in a way. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not leaning into fragmentation or that kind of abstraction. So yeah. I don't know if that makes sense at all, but, or if there's a line there that seems relevant here as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I actually, in my second book, which I'm kind of, you know, in the process of finishing, I spent a lot of time thinking about abstraction in part because a lot of these existentialist novelists and playwrights, they, they don't seem to be interested in the kind of grittiness of historical detail in the way that, let's say, the realist novel or like Yashpal's enormous, mm. you know, this is not that dawn, where everything is tabulated and you see what people are wearing. And, you know, there's just a kind of interest in representing representing the real that is like the most powerful mandate. Um, but actually with a lot of these existential novelists, and there were so many in the 60s, there were so many people who were really interested in existential philosophy, but also in kind of using certain technologies to think about their own post-colonial condition. I would say abstraction is an appropriate way to characterize mm -hmm. uh, their work. It's kind of given to a sort of, you know, metaphysical sense, like a philosophical kind of preponderance. You know, characters will sit around and think, um, and you won't actually know necessarily where they are, what they are, what the historical moment is. So I think abstraction becomes uh, important in that way. But the other thing I'll, I'll just say a little bit speculatively is, you know, we, it's it's very challenging to think about caste and modern together or next to each other because the the word caste but also the idea of having a caste is considered to be like um, hopelessly irredentist or something. So mm -hmm. the pathway to inserting a kind of caste analytic and to thinking about the problem of caste and anti-caste might not always be routed through the real, the realist, or you right, know, right. our kind of understanding. Now, Ada does have a painting like of potters, for example, um, and I didn't have a good enough image of that to show you. So you can imagine an analysis that might say, like, look, he was interested in potters, you know, but. I think there also has to be another way to introduce the caste question into the space of the modern. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would just open it up to any thoughts, responses, questions. I'll just remind you to turn the mic on so that we can all hear. But yeah, Nanvi, please. Uh, do you mind just speaking into the, into the mic, please? I just was wondering that do the vases that he paints, mm. like do they allude to the woman's body mm. form? And then I was also wondering about process. Mm. And so does he actually, do these women exist in his life or are they like more of port portraits as you kind of established or, mm. yeah. And does he paint out of, or uh, photographs mm. or yeah and did he do any like live sketches mm. um, 
Yeah, is what I'm just wondering. Yeah, I think all relevant questions that, you know, if I were an art historian, I probably would have made a point of mentioning all of those things. Um, as far as we know, he didn't use nude models, but I must say that, you know, when I refer to a critical blank around his identity, that's quite right. Most of the information is coming from a book by Kishore Singh, who's a curator at Delhi Art Gallery, but there's very little work on him in general. So as far as I know, no live nudes. Um, he did do portraits of some people in his adopted family. He became uh, very attached to um, a Patan family. Uh, the father was a lawyer, and it's his daughter that he had adopted as his daughter that he carried around and took everywhere. Um, and so there are some portraits of some people in, those, in that family. Um, but mostly, no, he just painted without a model and without photograph. The suggestion that you're making about the vase, people often make that association that the, the vases are women's bodies and the women's bodies are also still lifes and kind of vase-like. So there is some continuity, uh, I think formal continuity in that way. And then in terms of the actual painting, uh, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier, which is that sometimes he would use watercolor layered on top of itself to produce like this impasto like effect, you know, to produce like a something that looks thick, like a gouache, but he wasn't actually using very nice paints. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, remind me your name. Hi, I'm Sneha. Sneha uh, hi. Hi. Uh, Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, I think I have a very, uh, not very well thought out question because I'm still sort of processing all of the wonderful things that you brought up. Um, I guess if you don't mind me asking a question about a particular painting, I suppose, the one just before the slide. Um, uh, and I was really struck by the, the window and um, the scene outside, it seems quite like sort of almost rural mm. in a way. I mean, perhaps not even in India, um, so, and you know, you characterized um, Ara as somebody who's in, he was well-traveled, of course, but, mm. but very much a Bombay poet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering, like, in terms of, like, how you sort of characterize, uh, you know, you're pushing us to think about reading a nude as a genre and a form. Um, I'm just wondering, like, if it's, um, if I, you know, like, this, this kind of, like, asynchronous city that you point us towards is also sort of operating within mm. the painting mm. as a, and in a way like resisting a kind of totality perhaps mm -hmm. so uh, I was just curious if you know if the you know in terms of the self-referentiality um, you know that is a kind of like modernist praxis how is it um, operating in terms of like perhaps gesturing towards like these objects that are actually not making sense and mm. Yeah, I really love that question. I think that's that's a brilliant analysis of this painting, you know, that the window is doing something different. Even the, the way the window is constructed doesn't necessarily strike me as like eminently local or something like that. But also the colors evoke his other kind of Mediterranean-ish um, landscape. So I think that's entirely possible. And you know, I don't know exactly what else we might say about it, but I think your reading of kind of asynchrony within the painting itself, or, you know, multiple frames within the painting itself is really helpful to, you know, to think about his work more generally. I mean, one painter, one critic, ref you know, referred to his kind of surreal collection of objects because it, it seemed that, you know, the vase and the chair and the body and the the braid they don't they don't they seem incongruous so that's another way of kind of thinking about the painting you know this incongruity um but i think that's a very interesting and quite legitimate way to think about what is maybe a strangeness you know in some of these paintings and this one is kind of my favorite, I guess, in part because of the the book and, you know, the scene of reading, which I think is introducing something quite new. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, no, thank you for that. It was super interesting. Um, I, you know, not my area, um, but I, I found this really interesting, the sort of uh, 
impropriety, this question of impropriety, and there's sort of mm -hmm. two forms of impropriety in particular, like impropriety to say trend, and then impropriety to say decency. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, you know, the extent to which that's an analogy for say any um, sort of post-colonial nation where, where one cannot so go, go back to a pre-colonial time yet, mm -hmm. um, one wants to sort of throw off uh, the, the prospects of being sort of, um, you know, under the yoke of a kind of Western modernity. Um, so if, the, if there's a kind of singularity to, you know, being at that sort of fulcrum, right, say in the 50s or ju just after. Um, and I also, so it's more of a, you know, the sort of uh, cardinal sin of more of a comment than a question. But um, the, the other question I wanted to ask was that the assessment of the aesthetic values seemed to be with respect to um, a, a European modernism, mm. right? Um, yet necessarily, say, being... Uh, like, ha like what, what, what was, say, either Muslim or Hindu religious art or, or secular versions of mm -hmm. this, these traditions and how they can be seen to have influenced? I mean, mm -hmm. that could be a, a non-question, but I'm interested in, in how that squares with it. Because, I, I mean, I thought some of the, um, the others, the other painters um, that, that were associated were, were, were super interesting and, and really mm -hmm. illustrative as well, particularly the, one, the black one with the carve-out. Um, you know, I was thinking of the, the classic early, mm. um, you know, romanticism, the sort of absolute as black mm. or, you know, cows with you know, black cows on the black background and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, I guess um, there's this, the, the extent to which uh, we've heard a fair bit about, say, uh, European aesthetic precedent, mm. but say subcontinental mm -hmm. um, aesthetic precedent, um, which also makes me think of the, of the mise, um, Mise en abim as well, and mm. the sort of iterability and the referring to while sort of iterating as well. So there's a few things in there just to mm. think with. Yeah, no, I really appreciate your comments as well. I think it's quite interesting. Um, I, I think I have primarily focused on Ara's relationship to his peers, in part because his peers are very like exhaustively studied and dissected, and they are almost always read in you know, precisely within this push and pull of kind of European modernist traditions and then let's say local content. Um, so in fact, in some cases like Raza, for example, you see a lot of interest in like, you know, miniature painting and the sculptures in Kajuraho and how they might have influenced or shaped um, some of his work. But the question of, you know, Indian art epistemologies and histories and how they work, you know, in, in for all of these painters. Yeah, I guess I would say, there's also a premium value put on the newness and the disruptive and interruptive practices that these artists were working with. So it's not necessarily a focus of the criticism to look back to, let's say, other kind of art practices, folk art practices, what the Bengal school was doing, et cetera, to think about these artworks. That's just like one thing I would say uh, very broadly, even though I think that's a kind of legitimate uh, question or concern. And then people also work with the archive that was available to these painters themselves and the kind of things that they were doing and seeing. And that's precisely why like European nudes and European um, studies, etc., salon painting p that people had access to and they saw becomes a kind of natural, uh, you know, trajectory or natural way to think about it. But I, you know, I, I think I'd take your point as a way to think more broadly about some of the things Ara might have been engaged in. As an aside, he's almost considered like a bad painter. You know, I mean, he's not. He, he's really de devalued in the moment. He's like very much criticized in terms of his work, in terms of his realism, in terms of his traditionalism. So I'm also kind of working with some of the terms that were set up in the debate in the period. Um, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, So there was another mm -hmm. comment I had that was um, 
I, I was thinking about the the paintings within the paintings, but mm. and then and, and thinking about Foucault's discussion of Las Meninas by mm. um, Velázquez as well, yeah. and it's like it's interesting because in that painting, obviously the painter sees, you know, we see the painter seeing the painter, right? Um, but and there's, there's a kind of um, disciplining that's going on there. I'm wondering the extent to which you, a painter sees his own painting and the painting is a kind of disciplining as well, both mm. in the sense of a kind of disciplinarity of kind of participating in art. Um, uh, yeah, as a, as a kind of, what, what, by, by painting a painting one has already painted, including it, um, one is having to think about what they're going to leave out, you know, what they're going to do. And so there's a kind of, um, it's as much a study of his own painting practice as it is the things that he's painting. And, and I think it's super interesting comparing, um, including your painting in the painting or including yourself in the painting. Mm. Yeah. yeah, again, I really appreciate that comment. I mean, I think that's definitely an interesting way of reading it. I mean, I was also thinking about the period of consumption in which people are actually collecting and how these nudes are also collecting and you know hanging paintings, etc. But I think the unfinished quality, or not the unfinished, but the haziness of the inserted paintings is a little bit interesting as well. You know, do they suggest a different kind of style? Do they can suggest a different ethic? Is it is there some other perspectival reading to, you know, that would ensure that they are that way and challenging to read? Um, but I guess I was thinking about the tension in the paintings that is created by that gesture primarily and, you know, how we might read it and what it does. Um, but I think it's quite a radical thing to say, actually, this is like the first, let's say, the first subject of its kind that appears in the painting, who then also owns the painting. You know, if, mm. if, if we want to read it that way, it's like something to think about. Mm. Yeah. Do you mean this, the depicted yes. subject? Yes. It? Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Mm. Uh, any other? Yeah, just sorry to add to that, because the first one you showed, it looks like the exact same positioning, right. whereas there was a kind of inver inversion in the other ones, right? Um, like, sort of almost a mirror image that in one. some points. Yeah. yeah, like that one looks. That one is inverted. Yeah, there, I don't I, maybe know where this painting is. Yeah. I haven't been able to find it, yeah. Yeah, could you just speak maybe a little bit about what you mentioned about the sort of collecting and the, the practices of consumption? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I, I'm sort of thinking about that and then also sort of where these works live now, whether mm -hmm. they're you know, part of these the, the Delhi Art Gallery collections or in mm -hmm. Sotheby's. I'm just wondering sort of how you're framing it based on how he, how Ara is maybe thought of now and, and what and where his works are circulating now mm. as, as well because I think that's that's kind of like adds another strange anachronism as well. Yeah yeah I think now you know uh, his association with the progressive artist group uh, you know has also made his paintings very desirable and very expensive that's definitely true um, but it hasn't been that easy to find his work and then there's also this notorious question which in some ways is such a post-colonial question of like fakes and forgery um, so it's you know there are a lot of things that circulate that are not real this is a major major preoccupation in like Indian painting and Pakistani painting you know in a certain moment everyone says like oh I have one of those but nobody can you know attest to the authenticity of the thing um, but you know what is interesting about Ara what I found interesting in researching him is just the amount of work he produced you know in part because he was maybe a little bit fast mm. and so producing a lot of paintings also suggests maybe an analytic for us in terms of reading, you know, how much time do we want to spend on the little, the mirror inset, et cetera. Mm. Um, but it, you know, it also in some ways decanonizes some of the pieces when you know you have a, a really large collection, a rapid collection. And also when you have series like this, a series of black nudes, but then also blue nudes and white nudes and red nudes, you know, um, then in a way you have to think a little bit differently about your intervention or your reading praxis. Um, I think that's all I can say really about collection. Um, yeah. Oh, I was just wondering, like, did he kind of openly um, accept being part of the Bombay artists, mm. Bombay progressive artists group? Uh, yeah, because I think a lot of them entered into that group a little later mm. and then does that um, was he, I guess he must have also been influenced 
because uh, they all were very uh, close as friends. Mm -hmm. And I think you speak about Raza and mm -hmm. was he also influenced by MF Hussain's nudes and hmm. um, kind of very quasi-cubist though, his yes. Hussain as compared Absolutely, to so, absolutely. I think yeah. Aras are really quite different in right. that way, you know? I mean, he looks... You know, I'm not an art historian, but his stuff looks very retro in relation to all of the other painters you're making. But no, he's part of the originary group of the, you know, the Bombay Progressive Artist Group. And he's there in all the photos, uh, the earliest photos of this coterie. Mm -hmm. um, but just kind of less studied and less shown, but always included in discussions and known in particular for the nude and for the flowers, you know, for the still lifes of flowers. Yeah, beyond that, I, I don't quite know, yeah. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. I feel like I just came back from, back to Brown after a long period of time, and I feel like this is like the most interesting talk that I've been to in like five years, so thank you. Um, sorry not to kiss ass too much. <laughs> but, um, so something that, um, I was really interested in the discussion about color and kind of the difference between black and brown. And so like I think there's like the the common thing with like the impressionists for example that oh they don't they didn't use black. Mm. Um, and then like you like and then like in Gauguin which kind of Shergill was directly referencing in that paper is like famous for being like oh I went to the south because of the vibrancy of the colors. Mm. And then in that case for him it's both like vibrant colors and also brown which I feel, which I wonder where kind of sheer guilt sits in all of this. But also something that came up when you were talking about this was like the kind of economy of colors as well. I mean, so I worked with a kind of self-taught artist in Bangladesh who was working with um, low cost c colors. And basically like when you blended these colors, like which to kind of create like details in brown, you have to like blend it a certain way. And to blend colors, like you, it d dries unevenly. Like in a way that you have to like, you paint it and then if you like take a second and walk away and then you paint it again, you have to completely repaint the whole body. Hmm. Um, so I wonder how much like the use of black is like a economic mm -hmm. and time thing. Mm. I'm not not to sit not to like be like yeah. no this this is it. But it just it seems like that's like another dimension to it. Um, and also I'm I'm amazed. Like when you mentioned that he didn't use still life, so I was like what? Mm -hmm. How is this possible? Um, so I was wondering what how like without his own body as a model, without a wife, without I don't know like. How was he getting the female, like the form of the female body? Mm. Um, and I have a third. Po Actually, no, never mind. That's it. <coughs> mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can't answer all these questions. I'm just at too uh, early of a stage in terms of my research. Um, you know, one explanation is that he didn't do a very good job of it. I mean, that's what some critics would say that actually these are totally unrealistic and they're bad bodies, like he's not even that good at bodies, you know? So he, he had some harsh critiques um, in the period that, you know, there were like anatomical mistakes and things like that. Um, but no, I don't have an exact answer to how he went about his practice. But I think the idea of color as an economic problem and, you know, the production of color as being constrained by these different features is really, it's, it's a very interesting question, and I, I just don't quite know how to address it. The only thing you know I can say is that it's quite interesting that at a certain point he decides or he raises this rhetorical question, you know, should I give up using color? Should I stop using color? And he moves directly to like the slashed canvas or a canvas with holes and that is an unpainted or untouched canvas. And I haven't seen those. I don't know where they are. Um, I've tried to look a little bit, but I don't know if I'll ever see them. Um, so in fact, the question of color might not just be in terms of shade, although I raise black and brown, it might be more of a zero sum color, no color. Mm. Um, but I think it's a fair thing to ask about brown, and this is where the this is where the complex question of caste, I think, really comes in. So in the Gopal Guru piece I mentioned, 
on the aesthetics of touch and film. You know, Gopal Guru is a Dalit philosopher. He makes very clear that he's not talking about color. You know, when he says like color is connotes differently, and we, you know, we can't really think about color in terms of caste. Mm-hmm. Whereas globally, there's actually a very like powerful discussion of colorism as in relation to caste. And of course, there's the whole question of the caste as slur. I mean, anybody who's kind of read Mukherjee and Untouchable would see that, um, you know, there, etc. Um, but brown is really a complexity and thinking about brown as you know maybe accidental or the default I think obviously would have you know would ch- have would require us to sort of change and shift um, our analysis but in a way I guess I'm just thinking about begging the question and whether some of the things that we know about Ara's life and his painting and his work and the period can allow us to raise the question of caste mm. you know rather than strictly in any referential or representational way. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in in a way like it seems that even Ara himself is not sitting well within mm. his own mm. work and not sort of you're not being able to sort of pull these questions mm. from him as as a subject that is painting mm. the sort of I mean so in that way like the the lines you are drawing to um you know between caste and and race globally I think um are 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 expand are expanding in a way that he is not maybe framing it um mm. and so I, I don't know that's it's just it's you know because you started with thinking about um of how he's a sort of figure not quite before his time but a figure that's articulating something that is not cannot be understood until sort of mm. after although then you you talk about vision and the dalit panthers and and i would even say of course the the du bois and ambedkar correspondence mm. years yeah. before that also bring yeah. up this color line um in correspondence um that that's i imagine yeah. pre um yeah. the work that ara is doing right yeah so. so this is in the 60s i mean these paintings are in the 60s i mean i i think that's really all i can say about it right now is that this is a context politicized by the question of caste yeah. and it's politicized in this location in which ara is working um i don't really have any evidence to suggest anything else yeah. and in fact i would say like i'm not super interested in that yeah. evidence i'm just kind of interested in how we might you know use this as a provocation to read his work a little bit differently mm-hmm. especially since his work is is kind of I, maybe not dismissed but considered to be a lot less important for the various reasons that mm. i have mentioned and it really offers an opportunity maybe to re to reread mm. um but also back to the original question of like what does indian modernism in every single genre form and also in the state of the political itself like what does it have to do with caste you know mm. if you actually read most scholarship about the period it, it kind of has nothing to do with it mm. So this is maybe a way to think about that. And then I think the broader question might be about really caste and aesthetics more mm. broadly. And I'm thinking a little bit of this book um by Simon Gikandi called Slavery and the Culture of Taste in which he makes this interesting argument about you know everything from table settings to the architecture of a home and how the institution of slavery might have not directly but maybe through analogy through diversion through distanciation mm. it inflected the aesthetic world mm. you know including wedgwood and pottery and the fact that there is a veranda on southern homes and so i i was thinking about that a little bit in the background in terms of you know modernism which is having such a moment <laughs> uh you know and how exactly the problem of caste might interrupt mm. disrupt hide beneath mm. yeah. thank you I just kind of yeah sure i think when i'm thinking of the the, the black bodies mm. i'm also thinking of the sun house the mm. Mm-hmm. like thinking about uh, the non-kinker wedge 
Mm -hmm. was using a lot of concrete cement mm -hmm. to create these sculptures um, in a very uncanny, abstract way. Um, yeah, and, and the whole, and the sun house, uh, you know, very much inspiration of John Hopkins and Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, that's completely my characterization, and I use it in quotations, which that's how I use it. And I guess what I mean by queer is um, just his non-heteronormative social structure and arrangement. So I really didn't mean that literally, um, but I was thinking about how he he didn't actually have a family or genealogy to that that we can trace back in any very easy way. And in some ways, even the question of caste. Um, requires that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it requires some kind of form of association or affiliation or distance from that association or affiliation. Um, but in his case, he befriended uh, an entirely new family and took their daughter as his own and often lived with that family or stayed with that family at night and was really kind of linked uh, with them. And was referred by others, again, this is from the same source, Kishore Singh, as you know, a grandmother or a godmother to the child. So this is what I meant by queer, just simply, you know, and also not marrying, I mean, just many different things, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, what a provocative idea. I mean, clearly, um, I, I think it's very possible to say that, you know, nudity and the obsession with women is not about women, but about something else. And this is why I, I somehow felt, I don't know, enabled, empowered to say, like, is, is this, uh, are they autobiographical? Is this a form of self instruction You know, is something else happening in the paintings that really doesn't have anything to do with women or the nude or the model or anything like that, even though they seem stylized? Um, and I think that's possible in the sense that, you know, there's, it's a, it's a moment of self-fashioning and self-fashioning as an artist, as a modern artist. And Ara himself is considered to be fashionable and also to be interested in self-fashioning in a way. So I think that's another way to think about what's happening in the paintings, like as part of the construction of the modern artist and what does it mean to be modern, you know, always in a certain kind of suit and dressed in a certain way and having hair in a certain way. So, yeah, but I also really like the idea of extroversion as opposed to kind of referentiality like what is what happens in the space between the biographical figure or the historical figure that we know and then the figure that is represented in the painting you know what is the pathway by which we get from one to other you know and this doesn't have to be in like the form of platonic correspondence but can happen in many other pathways so maybe it can happen through inversion you know so yeah. Ara sees himself in one way, and then the painting does exactly the opposite, right? Or it, maybe it can happen through a kind of historical anachronism, like Ara sees himself in one way in one moment, and this requires, you know, a, a deep dive into like European salon painting or something like that. So I, I guess the idea might be just to like trouble the baseline referentiality of biography and image or biography and representation. Um, and so I, I think that's where your comment is quite interesting and helpful in terms of thinking about obsessively writing about women, but actually really obsessively not writing about women at all, but doing something else. 
Um, and, and just back to the earlier question, I mean, I, I guess I have to think about that in terms of like sculptures and other kinds of blackness and uses of blackness. I, I really do feel that, you know, Jamini Roy and the, other, the, the way you're thinking about the Santal, that it's quite different in the sense that it's very stylized. It's almost like iconic, like using a very iconic form. Um, and this is a little bit different from that. It's a different, different from traditions of realism, but it's also not stylized in exactly the, the same way or iconized, yeah. I think what you just said, about this, your response um, earlier, just about this kind of extroversion and the inversion mm -hmm. is, is just uh, really, really fascinating because I think a kind of alternate discourse where this question is very sort of um, front and center is photography, right? Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about indexicality, particularly, yeah, yeah. and which is also a sort of a very sort of important at this moment as well. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious because you're able to work across all of these paradigms. Um, you know, as as a literary scholar, how do you think that question of the inversion works maybe in the novel differently mm -hmm. than it might? Um, in the painting, um, mm. if we don't have to go to photography yet, but I just think it's interesting what it would mean to do this self-fashioning um, and non-referential work in the novel. Let's mm. say um, I don't know. It's it's just a it's just a provocation that came from your response. Yeah. yeah. What an interesting question. Okay, I have to think. <laughs> I really have to think about it. Um, I mean, I mentioned here. Um, you know, Flaubert's barometer because of this discussion in Barth that, you know, the barometer is not just a barometer, it's the whole kind of historical reel that is being represented there. So mm. the idea that, you know, in this French novel, the fact that there's a barometer on the wall doesn't really have anything to do with what the temperature is or the fact that they're middle class or anything like that, but the, the, the thing is there to tell you that this is actually realist. So I, I don't think that that is the case here. Mm. In other words, I don't think the point is just to say, like, this is actually a a real drawing room and I'm representing a real drawing room. I think there's some other drama in the painting that's happening between the painting and the painting or between looking and looking or seeing or looking outside the window, looking at the painting, looking self looking. Um, but yeah, I think the art historian would obviously say that there are totally different, you know, there are different kinds of traditions that are related to the discipline that help us understand you know, the kind of things that are happening in a text versus, and one of the primary reasons for this is because language, you know, works by different rules. Mm. But I have to say, I, I've been kind of reading all these, I, I've been reading a whole series of other things, like for example, you know, Jeanette on narratology, and you know, he says something like, the dream of every word is to look like itself. In other words, there's a kind of wish in the word to look like the thing that it is representing. Mm -hmm. So there's a desire to be really intimate with the thing that you're representing. And then like in what is literature, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre will say that actually the thing that is being represented is really only there in like a whiff, it's like a cobweb, you know? So the number 17 is really different from actually 17. And you know, the spider is really different from the spider in the world, but it only suggests in like a wisp spider ness or, mm. you know, the actuality of the spider. Mm. So for me, this is all kind of very interesting and fascinating because it really troubles the basic ideas of referentiality and yeah. representation and that, I would say that element is not the element that I'm interested in these paintings. Yeah. And I don't think that the answer is in, you know, who the woman was that he painted, who happened to be like a Dalit woman or something like that. But in, yeah, just maybe to shorthand as like modes of seeing or inferencing even, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you so much for that. I'm going to ask a question as not a modernist and not an art historian mm. and not even a literature mm. person, so uh, it might be very stupid. But um, part of, I mean, it, it's kind of related to this question of referentiality mm. um, uh, in the sense that for, for me there's something, I guess, there is something very radical in you saying it doesn't matter who the woman was, mm -hmm. but then, but it does matter to you who Ara was. And that to me also, yeah, I, I, I guess my question is what is it that, why turn to psychobiography in a mm -hmm. sense? Um, 
And it's not to say it's not important. It's not to say, um, because I know the opposite of that is you erase the context of Bombay mm. and the literature, and et cetera, mm. et cetera. So it's not that, but there is, what is it? A, a why turn to it? Um, mm. Which, to me, um, one of the things that was very interesting, in a way, the reference, it's true, it's not in the woman, mm. but the reference is also maybe not in him. Mm. And where yeah. there's a strange, this, and you brought up his desire, like what, what for me was, very interesting to see. It's like where, at a time when everyone's establishing themselves in their Indianness, mm. and maybe that's what makes him a kind of radical mm. Dalit painter. He, he's just like, let me, you know, I'm kind of influenced by the West, and mm. I'm, there's something else going on there, and which I don't say as a bad thing. I mean, there's a there is a rejection of uh, being called Indian modernist. Mm. So yeah, uh, and in a way, your project places him out and in of it. Mm. So um, mm. yeah, so so yeah, basically, a, the, the key to that is why biography, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and, I think it's a fair question to ask, like why biography. I mean, maybe it's a kind of place you begin, and it's it's how I began. But I think you know, even more seriously or more theoretically. Why begin with biography? Okay, so first I'll say, I don't think biography is biography. I don't think biography is like a stable category. You know, if, if Ara was doing things and pretending to do other things or presenting one way and looking in another way, it's not like we can go to his biography just for like some deep accessible knowledge about himself. You might even go so far as to say that he himself did not know himself in the sense that like he, he was really detached from his origins from a young age. On the other hand, like, you know, he had Urdu, he was from outside of Hyderabad. So, you know, he had certain things he absolutely had, but I don't think we can go there for some deep reservoir of anything. As far as I know, it's not accessible to find. And then he also did not seem to make it accessible as something like a trove, you know, um, that you could work with. But I, I take your point, even then, even then, I take your point regarding psychobiography. And I guess in this case, the biography is a little bit authorizing for me, because what I'm interested in is how to create space for a kind of cast analytic or a cast eyes reading. And it's a bit challenging it's a bit challenging to do that without that. Now, even as you say, you know, someone who's interested in, in like flowers in vases, doesn't that give us something to work with? Doesn't that give us a kind of challenge to the status quo? Um, doesn't it give us also a challenge to Dalit politics as it's conceiving itself, which is not interested in flowers and vases and drawing rooms, but in, interested in the street and being outside and doing other kinds of things with the political? So I guess what I would say is without that psychobiography, we, we have access to reading a kind of resistance or reading a challenge in all these different forms, but I don't know how close it can get us, you know, to, to the kind of caste question. That being said, the place where it is interesting to me without the history that you're referencing or without my line of thought is, is like in touch and touching, mm. which I think is really interesting. Like lying around, lying on a bed, you know, uh, just touching things, just coming close to things in the nude. And there is something just interesting and strange about it. But in order to go a little bit beyond that, I, I've literally resorted to the one line that I have seen on this. And sometimes the one line is, he is said to have been of the depressed castes. That's, that's, as, that's as close as uh, we might get. Thank you so much. I mean, it also, cla I, I, and I, I suppose part of what I meant was exactly this: like, why do we go looking for that which we cannot have? Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, and but but it's exactly in a way the question of touch. It's mm. it's the impossible touch mm -hmm. almost that's mm. present here, and which is also, I suppose, a question for. I'm I'm also a little less familiar with uh, mm. Gopal Guru's work, mm. but uh, I would be curious to hear a bit more. Um, especially in that painting we already discussed with Sneha. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I mean, yeah, I guess, uh, um, again, a, a similar question maybe. There's a kind of, we, we oppose the untouchability with some kind of touchability. Mm. But 
but also touch as a sense is it's an absolute mm. sense. Uh, it's the one sense that um, uh, uh, doesn't have distance between the object and the subject. Mm -hmm. And there's something very particular about it. And to me, that's the fascinating part as well about these paintings that, yeah, that it's, it's going after, you know, it, you cannot touch. Mm -hmm. It's uh, something, uh, yeah, but maybe you have more to say in relation to mm. Gopal Guru, and I would love to. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I really recommend this piece, um, you know, which is thinking about how the cricket ball is such an important, almost like iconic object that everyone has access to and everyone can touch. And everyone touches it in the complete absence or ignorance of, you know, what it is made out of and how it has been made. And, you know, he makes the case that this isn't like just about a Marxist reification where, you know, the people who make tables have no relationship to the table anymore. It's not just because they're commodities. It's obviously something caste related that you can intimately touch a cricket ball. You can even lick your spit and then touch it and then lick it again and throw an amazing like spinning shot. But it, it has nothing to do with leather or, or the leather worker in any way. And he even talks about like fingering the seam of the ball and you know what that sort of does to the to the subject it's really a very very interesting piece um but so for him that tactility is really important it's like the thing that is missing that everyone does but it requires a complex psychic negotiation to undo the relationships that have the the cricket ball has mm -hmm. in order to like fondle the cricket ball, right? So I was thinking a little bit about that. I came to that piece later, actually, before I, you know, out long after I started working on this. But I was just thinking about um, touch and also nudity together. So it's like one thing to touch, but then you can touch in different ways. You can't get too close. But nude at touching is like, it's of a different register because it's not just the hand here, it's the whole body that is touching everything, the entire space of the domestic. And that's the other thing, it's not just about touch, but it's about, it's inside. All these paintings are inside in which women are touching things and they're touching domestic things and they're touching things that are related to food, related to consumption, related to the seat, you know, the dinner table, the seating table, they're touching fruits, etc., all kinds of things. So I, I think touch is kind of the, the way in, um, but I haven't figured out the entire kind of like a polysemy of touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, so uh, I, I work with kind of like a collection of Dalit photographs in Bangladesh. Um, and so I know there's a lot written about studio photography. And I feel like what you're describing is like the exact opposite of studio photography. Whereas studio photography, like it's kind of in a space that looks like a studio, but in studio photography, you're like dressing your best to kind of exist in this kind of bourgeois space. But here, like they're touching things in the nude, and it, I don't know. It seems like like I keep I keep kind of comparing it to studio photography, and then in that you also I guess get to think of like the medium of like art versus photography mm. and stuff. Yeah, studio photography is also interesting because the kind of poses that you see in these paintings are so anti-studio photography. Yeah. You know, you you see it's not just like a woman sitting on the ground, but a woman kind of with her legs open or a woman lying on the bed totally naked. So there's like a deliberate interest in the body that way and also in the touch of the parts of the body that no one is supposed to touch, right? So it's not even, it's not even just about touching, but like the way, you know, the way like your elbow might lean or your breast might fall on a book. So I think it's so... Hmm. Yeah, it's something else. But so the stylization of the bodies are kind of, yeah, I guess suggest a, a different register of looking or seeing because they're, they're so indifferent to being looked at in the way of studio photography, which is constructive and con contrived, right? Yeah. Uh, Doral, if it's okay, maybe we can take a couple more questions. Sure. Um, if anybody has them or comments or just thoughts on All right, just one more thing. So, so I guess the question, going back to the question of realism too, and the sort of determinant, like sort of relates to the psychobi um, biography and also the, um, 
the Dalek question as to the extent to which um, you know social material conditions are determinants of something like like genre, right? Mm. And and or whether whether we ought to attribute sort of certain anomalies to um, something in the real world. Um, I, I'm thinking of two references here. One, one which is Ian Watts' novel, you know, history of the novel, or whatever, which which Anna was speaking about, and he was saying realism's not like what what it's showing so much as how how it is showing it, right? And then I think of another sort of um, art historical example, which is like, and this is not my area, so this is more apocryphal, but there's discussions of say like El Greco and his uh, like astigmatism as well, mm. right? Like this mm. sort of considered a particular vision, you know, considered a particular visionary or a particular visionary, like a particular way of looking at Christ or, or what, you know, doubting Thomas or whatever it is, um, you know, has had people thinking, and there's an art historian in the room, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but has had people speculating as to whether he, you know, he, he just had a sight problem, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, so it's super, um, you know, it's an in interesting question whenever we're thinking about determinations of culture on, on, on genre, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's maybe a little bit related to the earlier comment about paint and how paint dries and, you know, whether black yeah. met, was meant to be brown or whether brown was meant to be black, etc. So I think, you know, all those uh, kind of material historiographies, material questions are really interesting and important. And like that that's in fact, you know, the challenge and also the privilege is like how do we move from those material conditions questions to the kind of things that are happening in terms of poetics. I think that is a you know, in general, it's a really interesting question. And I, I basically just don't have all of the answers to that yet because in part I, I simply do not know enough and cannot find any critical material, can't have a challenge seeing the paintings like in person. Mm. So there are a whole range of things that are stopping yeah. um, that actually necessarily challenge the kind of that kind of analysis or material history analysis mm. in addition to the fact of like my training which is actually in the written word yeah. and, not, mm. and not this visual idiom. Yeah. Any last thoughts? Mm. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Toral, for that talk. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We can continue the conversation. Uh, there's a reception outside, so please join us. And thank you, Toral.